Well, welcome to the Archigen Axio in the ancient anatomical theater. Um, the university predates this anatomical theater by quite a few centuries, so why don't we start off by talking about the history of the university and how this room fits into that. So the University of Bologna is the first university in the modern sense, so founded in 1088. So when we say that, I want to choose my words very carefully because universities prior to that didn't exist within that same paradigm. There were ancient centers of learning, like in Alexandria, but they weren't a university within the context that we study today, in as much as a commune granting a charter to an institution to allow it to operate, for there to be a curriculum and faculty that are paid for students, for there to be a conferred degree at the other end, for them to then practice their profession, which is probably things like, like originally law, theology, and eventually medicine. So the University of Bologna founded in 1088. By 1156, there was a medical school, and it was within 100 years after that or so that dissection began. And dissection as part of the medical curriculum began at the University of Bologna as well. Surely, there were physicians who studied anatomy and outside of their scholarly requirements, but it was required initially at the University of Bologna for students for them to graduate and get the medical degree that they had to participate in at least two dissections before they could graduate, one of a man and one of a woman. And it's Mondino de Luizzi, Mondinus, who joined the university in 1306, published the first anatomy textbook in the way that we use it, in as much as it's made for medical students in the study of cadaveric observation that he published in 1314. He joined the university in 1306. By 1314, he, he published the Anatomia. And the Anatomia was essentially a recitation of Galen. So Galen was the second century AD Greek living at the height of the Roman Empire. When we look at modern medicine, we think of Hippocrates, sixth century BC, and Galen, second century AD, as being the fathers of medicine. But they didn't study it the way that we do today. Galen wrote extensively about anatomy, but a lot of it was wrong. And it wasn't begun to be corrected until we started to look directly at the body. But Mondinus just rewrote Galen and essentially adapted to a lab method, where he took Galen's anatomy and said, here's how you do a dissection in the educational environment. Where you begin here, obviously you would do the thoracic and abdominal uh, pelvic viscera first, because that's what's going to decompose and putrefy first, and then over a period of days later do the musculature. Does that make sense? The time of year that it would be done would obviously be the coldest time of year. Even though this is summertime right now, this is a very cool summer. Could you imagine the heat of a true July and August? So it would be done during Carnival, which is typically that time between Christmas and Lent. Right? And it would be done during those times for other reasons because there is certainly a cultural transgression to human dissection. And Carnival provides some cultural cover for that, if that makes sense to you. So that's what it was done. This room is a paradigm to how it would be taught in the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s, as far as how a professor would come in and teach. A professor would come in and ascend to the cathedral, right? And then condescend to the students. And he'd probably be reading from Galen. Galen was written first in probably Greek and then eventually translated probably into Arabic and Persian before it was ceded back to the West into Latin. So there would be many errors in it. But Galen was dogmatic in Bible, and not really the way we teach today, where we don't teach from the books. You know, what teaches us? The books or nature? Right? Science has one agenda, and that agenda is the truth. And it's the body and nature that's going to give us that truth, not the books. But it was still a dogmatic time, regardless of the fact that there was this new introduced paradigm of the body beginning to teach. Galen was still considered dogmatic. And if I could show you something, I'd like to show you something from uh, something that I have over here. Where's my little, there we go. In his Anatomia that Mondinus wrote, it was rewritten and rewritten, and by about 1495, this is the cover page that was added to it, which shows essentially what this room is right now, which is the professor up in the chair, condescending down to the students, but I want you to see some things over here. Do you see how there's this gentleman who actually has the blade in his hand? Do you see how he has a short robe on and everybody else has a long robe on, right? So the short robe, you can see the legs, that indicates barber surgeon, which is a lower gill than the physicians. Do you see how the physicians of the body, they have the professore, they have the long robes. And that stays with us today. When you go into any medical setting, the physician walks in, the physician has a long gown. 
the long rope. Which does the, the lab technician that draws your blood or the person that comes and shoots the x-ray, they have a short coat. And that goes back to medieval Europe at the University of Bologna here. And it stays with us. And all the academic regalia that we wear at graduation also stays with us from medieval Europe, really beginning in Central Italy. The first university of the world, in the world, the rise of the universities began here. Does that make sense to you? So this barber surgeon is doing the cutting because that was a lower sort of task that a professor would never get his hands dirty in. But if he's reading from Latin and this person here is of a lower class, does he understand Latin? What's the deal? No. Right? So he probably just speaks the vernacular of Bolognese. So it needs to be interpreted. And if you look over here, you see how there's one gentleman with a wand in his hand. Right? And he is the ostensor, so he's pointing out what the professor is saying to cut. So think about this teaching paradigm. As beautiful and as elegant as this room is, you have a professor reading from a book that's a thousand years old or more, that's largely based on animal dissection and inaccurate, and we're not likely to challenge. And it's being taught in Whisper Down the Lane, where another person interprets it into another language, again, for there to be more error. And if you think about this, is this a very productive way of teaching with everybody so far away, especially during the spectacle that was Carnival. Mm -hmm. So these rooms really were important in many ways for the status of the university more than they were for truly educating anatomy. Mm -hmm. So we know that there were many more anatomical dissections that were done quietly with smaller groups of professors at their homes, although they still had to participate in these larger spectacles. Mm -hmm. These spectacles were in, indeed that. They were um, Socratic and in a disputation style, where students would come down and intentionally be embarrassed in the way many of you were when you defended your doctoral dissertation. And that was part of the way and the culture. And the spectacle that it was became an embarrassment to the university over time, and then eventually became replaced with more direct observation and those anatomical waxes that we were looking at later. Does that all make sense to you as far as the story? And this room is important in many ways just by virtue of how we teach and what we do. And it celebrates many of the people that we've been talking about. Here's Mondinus right here. Mondinus de Luizzi. He is the reinstitutor of the cadaver in the medical curriculum, requiring it. He's often described as the resurrector of the cadaver. Who's next to him over here is Galen and Hippocrates and other physicians of the university. When we look at the professor's chair, or cathedra, the two statues that hold him up are described as a corchet or spalati, how they're skin, and you can see the muscles. Those are done, were done by Urkeli Lely, who did the anatomical waxes that we talked about, that we got to see earlier today. Does that all make sense to you? You see uh, the little angel at the top that's holding a humerus pointing down to the table, right? The humerus is supposed to represent the study of human anatomy, and the table and the, and the human body being the, uh, the, the, what's gonna teach us about it. Does that all make sense to you? Do you have any questions? Do you love being in this room? Absolutely. In the history that this room offers? So this room was completed in 1628, was used for a couple of hundred years about, and as another important history, this building was heavily bombed during the Second World War and had to be rebuilt. And if you look on your way out on the door, you can see some of the photographs of the severe damage that was done to this building and the reconstruction of it. And don't hesitate to look at the ceiling as well, just how beautiful and ornate it is. Is that cool? You can sit here as long as you like. So you're saying that none of this is original? I think a lot of it's original. You know, but it was re re rebuilt from everything that was knocked down. I'm sure there had to be some restoration to other parts of it. But like, in the pictures over there, the statues are 